Hey, so glad to have you here on the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. I had the opportunity to partner with the Global Leadership Network to interview Liz Bohan, and she spoke this year at the 2019 Global Leadership Summit. And quite honestly, there were a lot of amazing talks, but this one was one of, not only one of my favorites, but it was really one of the conference favorites. And uh, she's got a new book out called Beginner's Pluck. And so I'm excited to share with you um, in partnership with the Global Leadership Network, an interview I did recently with Liz Bohannon. This is the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. Hey, Liz, I am crazy excited to have you on with us today. Thank you so much for uh, taking time to do this interview. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited as well. A little bit of your background for some people that may not know who you are, can you tell us a little bit about your story? Especially, how'd you go from a journalism student in Missouri to a CEO of a large ethical fashion brand and speaker at the Global Leadership Summit? <laughs> well, I'll tell you that the road wasn't exactly straight and narrow necessarily, but I started out in journalism and became increasingly interested in issues that were facing women and girls that were living in extreme poverty and in conflict and post-conflict zones. And so I kind of had this, you know, dream that the New York Times would hire me and send me around the world to write about these really important issues and graduated from college. And it turns out that uh, the New York Times wasn't super interested in hiring a 22-year-old to be an international correspondent who had never really left the United States of America before. And so I took a corporate job and I had this moment about three months in where I realized, you know, I say I'm really passionate about this issue of women and girls and global extreme poverty, but I don't actually have a single friend who's a girl that grew up in that context. There was kind of this gap between what I said I cared about in my actual life. And so I quit that corporate job and I bought a one-way plane ticket to Uganda. And I showed up really just with the intention of building relationships and making friends. I had this journalism degree, um, but I, I really showed up just to learn as much as I could. And so throughout that process, I ended up meeting an incredible group of young women academically gifted, top 5% of female students in the country. And they were getting ready to graduate from high school and enter into a nine month gap between high school and university. And most of them were going back home for their villages to their villages, looking for jobs, couldn't find jobs. And also were losing all the social support that they had gained over the last two years with other really like-minded women. And so the organization was really kind of struggling to think about how to bridge this gap for these young women. And that just happened to be um, my community at the time. And so I was kind of naturally folded into those conversations and one thing led to another and I started a charity and then realized that we needed to be investing in marketplace business solutions to solve some of the world's most challenging problems. And so started a chicken farm and that failed. And then I launched a tiny little sandal company and made a promise to three young women that if they made sandals for the next nine months, that they would go to college and then came back home to the US and started selling strappy sandals out of the back of my car. And that's kind of how it all started. Now, if I remember your idea in college was you wanted to make a flip-flop that didn't do something. You want to make a flip-flop that didn't... A flip-flop that didn't flop, naturally, Craig. That's... I mean, I was really pontificating on the really uh, high-level philosophical problems at the time, you know, obviously. My, my whole life, I always thought if we could just have one that didn't flop, that would be amazing. <laughs> and and so you put, you put some straps on it and created this product that, that you, you were selling out of the back seat of your car. Yes. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah. And indeed they were flip-flops that didn't flop. So mission, mission accomplished there. So one of the things I love about your story is that you had kind of lofty ideas of how you wanted to make a difference in the world. And yet they were more in your heart, not in your actions. And you kind of closed the gap. In fact, I think that's really a big part of your story is ta taking what's in your heart and moving it into action. W what is it that drove you to actually go and take a risk and move across the world to do something different? Yeah, it was exactly that, Craig. It was that moment in the story when I realized I had all these like big ideas and go be, you know, an international correspondent for a really well-known news organization, come up with a corporate philanthropy scheme that involves millions of dollars that we can pour into initiatives that will help benefit women and girls. But the thing was, I wasn't doing anything about it because all of those either felt like external factors, right? Like I have to wait until the New York Times notices me to hire me to send me somewhere and they weren't <laughs> or it was just too big. Like it was like, okay, I'm 22. Like, 
okay, I might be able to start working on that when I'm 10 years into my career, when I have a different job title, when I have more resources. Um, so it was like a lot of, a lot of waiting, uh, maybe tomorrow. And it just, the idea of like these huge global issues can be so overwhelming. And, and my thought was like, well, it's a huge global issue. So it needs a huge global solution. And it wasn't until I really made that kind of core thing actually as small as it could possibly go mm-hmm. and say like, okay, maybe instead of thinking about a million women, I think about one. What would it be like to just be in relationship with and learn from and be friends with one woman? And because that was so relatively small, right? It's like, I don't have any excuses for why I can't go make a single friend. Like I don't need a certain degree. I don't need billions of dollars. I don't need my boss to say yes. Um, So it was really making it as small as it could possibly go when I was like, okay, I don't have an excuse anymore. Now I had to sit in this moment of like, if you still don't do anything, then you're kind of a fraud. And just stop saying you care about this issue. Stop saying you're passionate about it and go about kind of building this life. You know, that that's pretty strong language and I kind of want to highlight it, which is if you say you care and you don't do anything, you're a fraud. And I think that's a little bit about what makes you so authentic is the the willingness to call yourself that. And so I almost want to just play off that for some leaders listening right now and say, maybe let's just stop talking and go ahead and do something. And let Liz's story, and I want to hear more about it because it, it really is so inspirational. Let her story inspire you to let your actions line up with the things you say you value. And, and I, I want to pull some more out of this, uh, Liz. You have a, a book that's releasing on October the 1st. Tell us the name of the book. The book is Beginner's Pluck, Build Your Life of Purpose, Passion, and Impact Now. You took the phrase beginner's luck and you tried to shift the mindset. Give us some insight, please. Yeah. So I realized several years into my career that every time I was on the cusp of something interesting, of something good, something that really required a lot of risk, I had this nagging insecurity that like, hey, if you take this risk and then you bomb, you fail everybody is going to see you for this like imposter that you really are. And they're going to see that anything good that you've done up until this point in your career, like it was all just beginner's luck. So this was kind of this like insecurity that just kept driving me. And I would notice it really flaring up when I was on the edge of taking a really interesting risk or leap kind of out of my comfort zone into something new. And so I started just like really thinking about the phrase and like, why, why is this just like so nagging on me? Why is this creating so much fear? And so I was like, was there a time in your career where you didn't feel that specific insecurity? And so I just kind of like delved back into the archives and I had to go, quite frankly, really far back all the way to the beginning of my career and to this time when I didn't have that that insecurity. And so then I spent a long time thinking about what were the mentalities in the mindsets that I had during those earliest days before that specific insecurity started to arise. And what I realized was my my most free, most innovative, most creative time in my career is when I was a beginner. And it was when I was in this stage where I came to the table, not with the sense of like, okay, I'm super confident and I've got it all figured out, which I think is a lot of the messaging that we give people especially early on, right? Like just show up and be confident and fake it till you make it. And I think that that advice actually has some unintended side effects, like a lot of the advice that we're giving people in general right right now. So the whole book is actually quite, I think, counterintuitive. So I went through and started like realizing all these messages that we're getting in our culture that I think are creating an unintended consequence on people who are trying to build lives of purpose, passion, and impact. And so I really explore that in the book um, and offer some alternate, probably counterintuitive wisdom. Well, that's exactly what you do. And that's, that is the the exact word that I use to describe your talk to everybody that, you know, I was kind of bragging on it with, is it is counterintuitive. And there, we have so many sayings that are popular in culture that I think you're right, are bringing unintended consequences. You talk about a, a different idea. You you really believe we should be curious over critical. Can, can you unpack that idea for us? Yeah, I think when things get difficult, when you start to feel those feelings of, I'm out of my league, I'm not feeling like I'm keeping up, whatever it is, 
most people turn to criticism and there's two forms of criticism. There's external criti- criticism. So this is when you're like, they don't get my idea. They're not, you know, they're not taking me up. They're not taking me seriously. The circumstances aren't right. It's, you know, the market's down, whatever it is. And then there's internal criticism where, is your, where you start to say like, I'm not good enough. I'm stupid. I don't deserve to be here. Um, so you can choose either of those, but you also have the opportunity. I really use my desire. We all I think most of us have a pretty gut reaction to criticize when we're in a place of fear or feeling incompetent. I think that's a super natural reaction um, or at least natural temptation, right? I think we don't need to be down on ourselves for feeling the instinct to criticize, but we do have the choice of what we actually do with that and how we react out of that. And so one of the things in my in my life, I try to, in the same way that those feelings of like, nervousness and anxiety, trying to switch those to feelings of excitement. I really try to do the same thing with curiosity and criticism. The moment I have the instinct to criticize, that becomes like the signal to me, this like, you know, to like, oh, get curious, Mm -hmm. lean into that, ask the question. There's actually probably something really interesting in there. And frankly, it's probably something that wouldn't come to you naturally. So unless you come to the table willing to really ask questions, and here's the thing about asking questions they can't be leading questions, right? I'm the queen of this, like asking the question, but really trying to elicit the answer I want. So real and true curiosity. In my book, I use the example of being a journalist. And and I, you know, I call it being on assignment in your own life. And I think really good, unbiased journalists, they come to a story assuming that they don't know where it's going to take them, Mm -hmm. right? That's what makes a great journalist is they ask a question. And then when they find something that's a little bit different than they anticipated, they have a willingness to follow the lead and to kind of say like, oh, that path that I was following, I think I was wrong. Here's where the story is really taking me and actually go there. And I think if we can apply that principle to our lives, to our personal lives, I mean, this applies to when you're at the gas station and you run into a jerk. And instead of having a critical attitude, like if your first thought is like, man, I wonder what happened in his house this morning. That's like making him react in that way and like leaning into that. And I think we can use it in our businesses when our customers aren't reacting to something like we thought they were instead of jumping to criticism, getting really, really curious and continuing to lead in um, that that's where the really good, the good stories and information lie. It's so helpful. And I, I want to highlight that just for our leaders listening right now and kind of taking what you said, the, the words I, I try to tell myself, the point at which I'm most critical is usually an indicator of the place where I have the most to learn. And so mm, any, anytime you're studying Liz's work or you're, you're um, looking at a new model in your industry and you find yourself pushing back and saying, no, not in my world. No, this isn't true. What I've found is I often don't have the context or the experience yet to understand. And that's really mm-hmm. an indicator that I, I should stop criticizing and really come with an open mindset. And your work is really special. What you've done is you're kind of creating a a new market. You're employing people that otherwise wouldn't be employed. Can you tell me maybe a story? You've got several in your book, but one of your favorites of how curiosity helps spark your social entrepreneurial venture. You know, if we go all the way back to the very beginning, I would say the model itself was born out of curiosity. So I showed up in Uganda and was like, okay, you know, I grew up in America and I have heard stories about women in Africa. And so when I showed up and faced this problem of under-resourced young women not having enough money to go to university, I immediately jumped to the conclusion as I briefed a little bit earlier about like, oh, okay, I've been here, done that, like seen this a million times. We have to start a charity. We'll like start a sponsorship program and we'll match up women in America with women in Uganda. And I thank God I was still in this. So I was like, this problem had emerged and I was like kind of trying to solve it. But like I said, I had this journalism degree and I think I was like kind of playing this persona of like being a journalist at the time. And I'm so grateful because before I launched that idea, I was like, I'm just going to spend weeks setting up coffee meetings setting up, you know, informational interviews, going on walks and just digging in and asking the question in a way that really did feel open-handed. Like, hey, here's the problem as I see it. Here's a potential idea for solutions. Help me. What are the holes? 
what am I not seeing? When I tell you that, you know, in your perspective is completely different than mine. The headmistress of the girl's school, the um, person who kind of works on longer term finances for the organization, the women that at the school themselves, like really getting in. So design thinking is kind of a school of thought of how we solve problems. And I love, there's a phrase in design thinking that is like, hey, instead of going for the bird's eye view, get the worm's eye view. And I mm. love this, like it's get good. up as close as possible to the problem that you're trying to solve and then really lean in and listen. And when I did that, I started hearing these like clues. No one outright said you should start a business. But what they were saying was like, okay, you got to keep the girls together. They can't go back home to their villages. Um, There's a bigger problem in our economy, which is that people are graduating from school and then they can't get work, right? We have this super high youth unemployment rate. And it talks about, you know, larger things that are happening in the economy stagnating. All of these things were like, oh, these, it feels like that's the real issue. And that's certainly not going to be solved by me coming in and matching up, you know, a, a group of women with a group of women in America who can send them checks. And so it was really this kind of thought process of like, ooh, that feels like a clue. Right. Great. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to follow this and go in a completely different direction. And that kind of rabbit trail of piecing together the clues to create a solution um, that was very different than the one I originally came to the table with. I think it was step by step, asking questions, being curious, making mistakes that led you to a really amazing story. At the Global Leadership Summit, Liz, I brought three of my kids. I brought Sam, who just graduated, Stephen, who's 16, and Joy, who's 14. And they loved your talk. But you said something that was really different than what everyone else is telling them. The culture says today, follow your passion, follow your passion, follow your passion. But you'd have different advice. I do. I, oh man, and I am the, I am part of the generation that it is just like every time I open Instagram, every time I go to a conference, someone is telling us to, you know, like find your passion, like go out there and, and find it. And I think that that phrase is actually really toxic because this notion that your passion exists, it's out there. It's like fully formed and it's waiting for you, right? It's <laughs> waiting for you to make the right decision, to open the right door, to have, you know, the right conversation with the right person that gets you the job. And that's where you're like going to find your passion. I think that that's a really toxic thing because it it puts us in that place of passivity. And it also puts us in the place where there is so much pressure. Like I have to open the right door to find this mystical, magical passion that everybody's talking about. And then by the way, the next message is once you find it, everything else in your life is going to fall into place, so right? Good. Yep. And it's just like, I'm sorry, if you replace that with anything else, like I think in my parents' generation, it was money and it was security, right? That if once you achieve that, then the rest of your life is going to fall into place. I really believe that passion has become my generation's new idol, right? It's this beautiful thing. And it's how God designed us to exist, you know, in communion with him, co-creating the kingdom of God here on earth. But the moment that thing becomes like the end all be all, okay, well, now we have an idol, right? We've just taken a good thing and we've given it too much importance in our life. And so I really believe that the mentality around building your passion, that it's like, this is it. This is your story. It is on you to go out there, to ask the questions, to be curious, to build, to take, and frankly, to be willing to be surprised by that. Like Mm -hmm. you never in a million years, Craig, could have told me, that 10 years in, I would be running a for-profit international fashion company. Like I hated fashion, not interested. You know, a lot of these like influencers have these like stories that it's like, oh, when I was a little girl, I was already doing this on the playground. And it's like very nice. And in like, I think if that's really your story, that's awesome. If you've always known what you were passionate about, but what that does to the rest of us who don't have that story is it makes us feel like we're broken and that we're missing something. And it doesn't help us feel empowered to actually go out and just build it. So we're going through life looking for this mysterious, elusive something and everything's a letdown and people may not take the first step. What I found is I agree with you completely. When you do dive into something, you actually can become passionate about things you never even thought you'd be passionate about. And so I think it's a really, really helpful message. You also would say something very different than what I'm going to see if I open up the normal Instagram page today when everybody says, think big, dream big, conquer the world, make a difference all over the world, you would say there's actually probably even a more helpful message as well. Tell me about it. I would. You know, here's the thing. We hear about dreaming big all the time. 
And I am genuinely a big fan of dreaming big. If dreaming, if you are in a place in your life where you're dreaming big and you're actually taking action, like that's amazing. Keep going, keep doing it. Who I'm talking to though, are the people that feel pretty paralyzed and overwhelmed by that message of like dream big. And we start to ask ourselves, we have these beautiful dreams. We have these visions. And then the first thing that we do, instead of the first question being like, awesome, what's my action step? What am I doing tomorrow to help this come to life? The first question starts to become like, is this big enough? Mm -hmm. Like, am I doing, is this big enough? Should I, I should probably wait. I should probably wait and I should make it a little bit bigger and I should ask for more people's opinions and I should make it sound more impressive. And then maybe someday I'll just like emerge onto the scene with this huge dream. And I think that that's, that makes me really, really, really sad when I see people doing that because I know that the likelihood that that dream ever actually turns into something is actually really, really small. And so I, I really just want to give people the freedom to say like, hey, it's big enough. Now just go do it. And frankly, I think it's so much healthier to have a like relatively small dream and actually do something. And then you get put in this place where then, okay, now your next small dream might be a little bit bigger, but that's going to lead you to the next thing into the next thing. That's how we build lives of purpose and passion and impact. It doesn't happen sitting in a room pontificating and dreaming and researching and coming up with this big, super impressive plan that then we need to be successful right out of the gate, right? Because if you spend all this time on the big dream, what that actually does is it can keep you from being curious and from iterating and evolving because you become really attached to the big dream. It's like, oh my, well, this has to work. This has to be the thing. If you dream small, you're actually a lot more willing to get into it and go like, okay, I did this small dream. Wow, that wasn't exactly what I expected. Okay, so next time I'm going to try this and I'm going to tweak this a little bit or like, wow, that actually is what caught my attention. And you get to follow that lead. And I really believe that that's a more healthy way to, to think about it. Liz, I love this. I, I hope that there's someone listening right now that kind of like you said earlier, you, you know, they're thinking, making some big difference, starting a big company, creating a big brand, making a big difference, a big ministry or whatever. And have been thinking for a long time. And this just gives them the courage to start right now, right where they are, do something, take a really small step take a risk, set up an appointment, start, write down step number one. I love the idea that sometimes we don't, we can't see step number seven, so we don't take step number one. You'll, yes. you'll never hit step number seven unless you take step number one. And even if step number one is really, really small, let's just take it today. Take that step. Yep. I want to hit on one other idea that you you, you drive home. And Liz, you say that, that we should get hooked on making um, mm. and keeping promises Tell us why that's so important to you. So we live in a generation, in a world, in a society that I think is filled with a lot of BS. And by BS, I mean busy and should. There's a lot of busy and shoulds getting thrown around. Of We're all like so busy and we're so important. And we all also live in this life where we're constantly thinking like, I should do this. I should do this. I should be here. I should be this type of person. And in the book, I explore this concept of being a person that makes and keeps promises and specifically your VIPs, your very important promises. Um, I really think that in order to build a life of purpose and passion and impact, you have to do the hard work of knowing what the absolute priorities in your life is. And there's, there just frankly can't be very many of them. Um, And I call those your very important promises and getting really crystal clear on like, this is my promise. And this is what that means, right? So one of my very important promise areas is parenting and motherhood. I have a three-year-old and I have a one-year-old and being a present parent who is stewarding the lives of her children is really important. But a, a, a good promise is not like, so I'm going to be a good mom. Because what that does is that opens me up, that opens me up to everybody else's definition of what is a good mom, right? And and then I start having this thing of like, well, I should be doing this. I should be, you know, this. Our house should look like this. And someone else is putting their kids in this class. So I should think about that. And instead do the work to say, what is being a really good mom? look like for you and get like crazy granular with it and say, these are the things that I believe in. And I'm going to make a promise to myself and to my family that I do these things. And that means that when something comes up, when Jilly 
Joey is doing this thing with her kids. And that strikes this insecurity in me of like, I should be doing that with mine. I have this thing that I can go back to and go, did you write that down? Right. Was that a promise that you made to your family? And when I look at my list and I say like, nope, like that thing that that Jilly's doing down the street, like never even occurred to you as being a part of, you know, being a good mom. So let it go. Like kick the should, kick the shit out of it, if you will. We don't take our promises seriously enough. We throw it around. And if we can just do the really, the really difficult work of saying, what matters to me? What are the things that are going to help me build my life of purpose, passion, and impact? And then take those crazy seriously um, and let those be kind of the guide for how we spend our time and our energy that we're, we're much more likely in the, in the long run to build something that matters. So Liz, can you bring it home for us? I actually am thinking about doing something and I've been putting it off. And I, I know that there are some other people out there that have an idea. It could be for business. It could be to be innovative in their church. It could be for a ministry or such. Talk to us about how to, to channel our inner beginner to start this cycle of innovation and to do something special. I think the first step is to tell yourself and to really try to believe it that there is no shame in your beginner's game. I think that shame is the thing that keeps us from from learning. And I think when we when we find ourselves in this place where we're like, I don't I don't want to embarrass myself. I don't want people to look at me and fail. Well, also, here's a tidbit. No one's thinking about you as much as you think they're thinking about you. Mm-hmm. I'm going to propose that it might not be insecurity. It might actually be an inflated sense of ego. Because what's happening is you're actually thinking that people are sitting around waiting for your next move, going to evaluate you. Like, I'm sorry. Actually, no. Like, no one is thinking about you that much. And I think that that sounds really harsh. But I think, at least for me, when I'm like, oh, I'm just feeling insecure, I don't really have a path out of that. When I'm like, girl, you got an ego problem. I feel very empowered and inclined to deal with that and to say like, okay, you need to step back and think, put yourself like in your right place. I feel much more motivated. Um, And so I think that that's what I would encourage is the first step is like, no one's thinking about you as much as you think they are. So you have the freedom, like go out, take risks, make a couple wrong calls, turn in the other direction and build something awesome. So at the same time, I feel like you hurt my feelings telling me no one's thinking about me as much as I think. <laughs> and I feel inspired to go and do something. So thank you for that. that and, I and think that might be a pretty good summary of the book itself. I, I felt pretty offended, but then somehow encouraged and somehow inspired. It's, it's at least off- that's my it's hope. A, it's offended in a good way and inspired in a great <laughs> way. And so Liz, thanks so much for um, being on the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. I love your heart. I love your passion. I love your message. I'm so excited about Beginner's Pluck. For everybody who's listening, you'll want to grab that book. And a special thank you for your contribution at the Global Leadership Summit this past year. You were a real highlight. And so I celebrate you and congratulate you on a new book. And I pray that it impacts a lot of lives. I know it will. Thanks, Craig. And thanks, everybody listening. So thanks again for being a part of our leadership community. As always, if you're new with us, I'd encourage you just to hit the subscribe button. And that way you'll get new content. We drop a new teaching on the first Thursday of every month. Also, thank you for rating this content or writing a review. If it adds value to your life and you could do that for me, that would mean a lot. Let's take Liz's advice. Go out and uh, do something small today. Don't worry about it. Don't feel pressure to get it all right because we say it every time. People would rather follow a leader who's always real than one who's always right. Thank you for joining us at the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. If you want to go even deeper into this episode and get the leadership guide or show notes, you can go to life.church slash leadership podcast. You can also sign up to have that information delivered straight to your inbox every month. In the meantime, you can subscribe to this podcast, rate and review it on iTunes, and share with your friends on social media. Once again, thank you for joining us at the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast.